you go. This film is considered, as you will see, a coming of age, whimsical and heartwarming comedy drama released in 2003. It's the only film made by this director. But you may know him more than likely for having written the script for the uh, animated movie, The Iron Giant. However, the fact that this was made is really wonderful. West with Giraffes is a coming of age film. This is a coming of age film too. And we see a little boy here by the name of Haley Joel Osment. Haley Joel Osment's first appearance on screen was playing uh, Forrest Gump's little boy. And he was all of six years old at that time. He did a pretty good job. And in 1999, M. Night Shyamalan was told, take a look at this kid that was in Tor Cora Forest Dump. And he said, well, he's just a cute little blonde. I want somebody who can act. They said, take a look at this cute little blonde. This cute little blonde gets an award for his performance. He's good. When he says, I see dead people, you believe him. And he holds his own with Bruce Willis. He's nominated, this thing is nominated for 17 major awards. And Haley Joe gets one for his performance. He's only 10 and he has something to deal with. 2001, he's 13 and he's going to turn 14 while they're making this movie. How old is Woody in West with Giraffes? He starts off as 14. So they're the same age. And they're going on quite a trip. Now, artificial intelligence, he's a robot, an animaton. And that animaton is taught how to love. And he's given to a, a family as an experiment because they have a boy who's going to die and they want to see if the mother and the animaton can connect and they do. Little boy doesn't die, doesn't like this uh, robot brother and sees to it that his mother believes he's a danger and they throw him out. So in some ways, he becomes a secondhand robot. He, he thinks he's eight. He's looking for the blue fairy to turn him into a little boy. He never finds the blue fairy and he shuts down. And several centuries later, they come across in some ruins, this little animatron that has shut down and they recognize it. This is the first one that was taught to love. He's still around. So they charge up his batteries. Now all he wants is to find his mother. I, I, I want to be a little boy. I want to be loved. And so they program him to believe he's seen the blue fairy. He's turned into a real little boy. And he dies happily when they shut him down. Now, do you see some similarities here between the movie? And what's going to happen? Yeah. And when we were talking about that film or that book, I said, I know the exact movie we need to see. Did you see a giraffe in this movie? Oh, yes, you did. Yes, you did. This is Tom McCandley's. And this is him standing out in front of the premiere of his film. Now you think about this kid. He's pretty good, isn't he? But he has to be, doesn't he? Because he's up against some really serious actors. Casting is the magical word in this film. He's up against Michael Caine. Michael Caine is so terribly nearsighted that when he takes off his glasses, his eyes just have this beautiful romantic look. So he's a leading man, he's a sex symbol. He can play military officers during the Zulu war. He can play military officers in Ireland. He can play people in the Shakespearean time period. He can play a spy. He's Cockney. He had to learn how to speak English properly before he could even get on stage. And there's a reason why when you hear him talk in this film, 
he talks a little bit differently. And we're going to hear his explanation for that. But right now, he just seems to be pretty well educated when you hear him. Well, my favorite actor happens to be Robert Duvall. And if you've ever seen To Kill a Mockingbird, you've seen his debut on screen as Boo Radley. And he doesn't say squat, but he's this wonderful presence. He'll go on to portray Robert E. Lee on a long series that ran on television. If you've ever seen cowboy movies, he makes a great cowboy. He does a bunch of them. The best one that we know is Lonesome Dove. But he holds his own with Marlon Brando in The Godfather because he plays his attorney. So Robert Duvall and yeah, good old sexy uh, Cockney. Michael Caine. Michael Caine, thank you. <laughs> I hate getting older. He's wonderful. We got Kira Sedgwick. Now, she's not that well known. Everybody knows she's Kevin Bacon's wife. That's where she's famous. But she did do a good television series, and now she directs and produces television. She is something else. She's had small parts in movies, and this is a small part in this movie, but it's an essential one. Now, we don't have a name for this lion. This is actually a cub. This lion is not totally grown. If he's grown, he's going to play meaner than he plays right now. Right now, he plays rough, but he's not going to bite or scratch like he would if he's a little older. It's actually a he, not a she. We don't have a name, but he gets a name in this movie, and that's Jasmine. But this is a real lion, and this is not Haley Joel Osmond with him. This is his trainer. But we've got a real lion. Now, why is it called secondhand lions and not secondhand lion? Well, if you are worn out and you have been used and you know you are past your prime, if you're a human, you are kind of like us, you know. But if you don't have anything to do and you don't have anyone to play with, you kind of draw inside and you wait to die. You are secondhand because you are not usable anymore, just like the lion is. She's not usable. She's secondhand. She's old. She's sick. She's tired. We have three secondhand lions because a brave and courageous man a fighter is often called a lion. So we've got three people who are past their prime, or two people who are past their prime and an animal. And now we meet Walter. If you have studied theater, if you have been taught how to write a play and a screenplay, the first thing they tell you is never use flashbacks. Flashbacks are terrible. You'll lose your audience. It's a cheap way to tell a story without having to pay for more actors and more sets. And that's why a lot of people use flashbacks and you're told they're not a good thing. How many flashbacks are in this film? This whole film is a flashback and it's got flashbacks within flashbacks, but it works. And that means you've got a good screenwriter. McCandless gives us a great one. We meet Walter. Walter's an adult. Walter is a, a comic strip writer. He's a, a man who does this beautiful little series of comics. He's a success. And he gets a telephone call. And after he gets this telephone call, we get the flashbacks. Now, the uh, director liked the work of Berkeley Breathitt the man who created the political strip Bloom County and does some other things. And by the time he is approached by Candleys, he is actually illustrating children's books. And he does special illustrations for this. He has a fake series that he calls Walter and Jasmine. And as you look at these cartoons that appear at the beginning and at the end, it's actually 
bits and pieces from the movie. So you get a feel for this. You get an understanding that, well, yeah, maybe this is real, maybe it's not real, but it's going to be nice. We get a reflection in this. And the Candleys knows what he's doing. At the very beginning, when Walter is dumped on these strange old men, you see him kind of cowering on that porch. But near the end of the film, he's not crunched up. He's sitting there. He's upright. He's got his legs apart. He's got on a jacket. He's grown up. He's learned something. And he's unhappy in the first bit because he's stuck here. He's unhappy the second time you see him because he's leaving. So something has changed. Now he's got a mother who should never have had a child. We don't know if he ever had a father that he ever met. Was mother ever married? We don't know. All we know is mother is more concerned about herself than she is her child. And we also know she goes out finding men to mooch off of. And she's found some grand uncles she never knew she had who supposedly are very rich. Well, honey, I'm gonna leave you with your great grand uncles. And I want you to find out where they hide their money. I'm going to stenographer school and I can't have you with me. So you stay here with them for the summer and I'll come back and get you. Uh -huh. Roger Ebert says, if a boy is gonna spend a summer with some uncles, these are the uncles he wants to be with. And it is, they just don't know it. So when you meet May and Walter, they're in a car, she's telling him, I'm going and I'm going to leave you with these guys. And good Lord, do you see this sign? This is the road she's turning down on. Turn back now. We don't want you. And listen, take a look at where they're going. <laughs> this is the creepiest house you'll ever hope to see. Walter's bedroom is going to be up on that very top floor. This is not a welcoming place. It's creepy. And what do they hear when they pull up in front of it? Gunfire. Now, if I were the mother, I would say, you're not coming here. But no, May gets out and she goes to see who's shooting what. And it's the first sight of the grand uncles, Garth and Hub. And what are they doing? They're fishing their way with shotguns. And you hear one of them saying, you winged him. And the other one saying, he's making a run for it. And they're having a fine old time shooting fish. And May says, yoo-hoo. And she's dressed up in her finery and she looks like a nice person, doesn't she? And who's this? They really don't want to talk to her. Who are you? You don't belong here. We don't know what she tells them. All we know is that she goes into the house with them there's a long period of time where Walter is left on the front porch and she comes out and says, okay, I'll be back. You know what you have to find while I'm gone. Have fun. And she leaves. Has he ever seen animals? Don't think so. Because when he sees the pig, he calls it doggy. Nice doggy. He's never seen anything like this. And now he's got dogs. <laughs> now you look at these dogs. There are things in this story that stand for something else. These dogs are all strays. Nobody wanted them. They wound up here. Now, Gary will say, well, there's always a dog on a farm. And yeah, there's almost always a dog on a farm, but not this many. And the reality is the pig and the dogs have wound up here because nobody wants them. Just like Walter's here. Nobody wants them. <coughs> there's something about a dog. If you're kind to this dog, if you don't beat it, if you let it eat and have water and a place to sh be sheltered, they'll love you. And a dog loves the way it's treated. And if you're treated well, it'll love you. 
Well, Walter's going to find out very quickly what the granduncles like to do more than anything else. He hears a car coming. He says, there's a car coming. Yep, and they reach down and they get their shotguns. The car stops. Everybody knows these guys have money. And here come all the traveling salesmen. And one of them's got something to sell them. And this is how they tell them we're not interested. They shoot their shotguns, don't shoot them at them. They shoot them in the air, the guys run. This is their pastime. This is what they do. And that first night, they tell Walter, now you're gonna go all the way up to the top, to that big room on the top. He wants to know if he can watch TV and they say, we don't have it. We don't have television. Now, we're old. And if we kick off in the middle of the night, kid, you're on your own. Now, this is a nice thing to tell a little boy who's just been dumped with you. He goes up to this room. There's two beds in there. Oh, there's dust everywhere. There's an old trunk. He opens it up. It's full of dirt, but there's a picture of a beautiful woman in there. And he wonders who that is. How did that picture get up there? Well, his uncles have told him, you know, if we die in the middle of the night, we can't help you. But he comes to the awful realization that all these two old men are doing is waiting to die. That's all they're doing. They're shooting off guns. They're shooting at fish. They don't do anything else. Oh, somebody needs him? Yeah. I don't think I can. I think somebody in your office is supposed to do it. Yeah, somebody in the office is, because I'm not co-hosting with this. Oh, I know. But... Snap hand. They're waiting to die. And that's why they've told this kid, if we kick off in the middle of the night, you're on your own. Well, in the middle of the night, he hears something. He doesn't know what it is, but he hears the door close and he goes out and, well, it's Uncle, Uncle Hub. Uncle Garth is Michael Caine. Uncle Hub is Robert Duvall. And Uncle Hub has a plumber's plunger, the thing you get a, a toilet unplugged with. And he's out there having a sword fight with nobody. And Walter is sitting there, and you'll notice the dogs are sitting there. The dogs are used to this. What is he doing out here? And then all of a sudden he stops and walks back to the house. Okay, he's never seen anything like this. And so this isn't letting me change things. There we go. There we go. He's watching Uncle Hub sleepwalk. And in the morning, he's got to fit in somehow. So he says, Mom says you guys were gone for 40 years. Where were you? Uncle Hub says, yada, yada, yada. I don't like people talking to me during breakfast. Shut up. Okay. He's not going to interrupt them during supper. But we know one thing for sure. He's not going to ask them about where they were, not right away. And now here come the other relatives. We don't know what relation they are, but we do know they're there because they know there's money. And they've left a will. Have you signed it yet? Nope, we're not signing it. They have three of the most miserable, rotten rats with them. And the mother sees Walter and says, who's that? Well, he's staying with us now. Why? Why is he here? His mother's left us with, left him with us. She's gone? Yeah. Well, then put him in an orphanage. He doesn't belong here. Walter says, I've been in an orphanage, thank you, and I don't want to go back to one. The uncles come to the realization that these relatives that they don't like, don't like this kid. And if they're annoyed with this kid, guess what? This kid's staying. And he does. He stays. But there's an issue. He knows he's not wanted. 
Those uncles don't know what to do with him. His mother's went off and left him. He's found a telephone, called the school she's supposed to be in. She's never enrolled there. He gives all of the last names she has used ever since he was born, and no, she's not here. And now here are these other people who don't want him. So if you're not wanted, what are you going to do? You're going to run away from home. And this is what Walter decides to do. Nobody wants me. I'm running away. He's going to go to Montana. Well, he gets as far as a local store, and he's sitting down there. And who should turn up but his two uncles driven by this relative that, uh, and they say, this is your fault because your wife hurt his feelings. So you let us hunt for this kid. And when we find him, you take us back home and then you get lost. So they tell little old Walter, you know, you're not equipped right now to go run off to Montana. That's a long trip. You don't have a good map. Will you come on back with us and we'll get you ready to go. And so he goes back and he learns to fit in. He learns that it's okay to have the dogs and his uncles aren't going to shoot you. But he's really curious about Uncle Hub. And one evening when he's down there watching him with his sword fight, Uncle Garth joins him. And Walter says, why is he doing this? Well, what is what went on with you? And Uncle Garth, who's the one who's more social, says, well, it all started when we were really young. And Uncle Hub wanted to go to Europe. And he decided I needed to come with him. And my parents let us go. And now we get the first of a series of what we would call fairy tales or bedtime stories. Is it true? Well, it has to be, doesn't it? Maybe, maybe not, but they get to Europe just in time for the Germans to attack. And they're right in the middle of a world war. And of course, Uncle Garth wants to go home and Uncle Hub says, nah, this is gonna be fun. This will be an adventure. And they stay in Europe. They don't leave. They see it all. He says, we're one step ahead of the Germans, but eventually, because Uncle Hub is really adventurous, they join the French Foreign Legion. Now you look at the horse that Uncle Hub rides. It's white. Heroes, near gods, they ride white horses. The good guy always rides a white horse. And so there's a white horse. And yes, they get into some real scrapes. Uh, somebody wants in, and I don't know how to let him in. It doesn't show up here. Okay, it's showing up on my screen. Yeah. Okay, so they're in some real fights. And Uncle Hub saves Uncle uh, Garth's life more than once. He's courageous. He's a lion. Well, after the war, he winds up being hired to go put an end to the slave trade. And he rescues a group of people who were going to be sold as slaves. And one of them is the maid to a beautiful princess. And she goes back to her princess and tells her all about this handsome young man, this American who saved her. Well, they're in Arabia, and so the princess decides, I'm going to find something out about this man. And she races down on the beach with him. He thinks she's somebody coming to attack him. And he suddenly realizes, it's not somebody come to attack me. It's a really good looking girl come to meet me. And of course, we know what's going to happen. The beautiful princess and the brave hero are going to fall in love, but there's an issue and that has to do with this man. She's been promised to that she cannot stand. 
And he tells Hub, stay away from Jasmine. She's mine. Well, Hub's not going to do this. And he runs off with Jasmine. And of course, the sheep wants him back. I mean, this is a really good story, isn't it? And we get to a good point in the story and, and Garth always stops and says, well, I'll finish it some other time. So you're sitting there, when are you gonna tell the story again? Well, now he's gonna tell the story. The man puts out 10,000 gold coins on his head. Bring him to me alive. I'm going to kill him. And so somebody captures Garth. And they bring him in in chains. And the man who captured him is all covered up so you can't tell who he is. It turns out it's Uncle Garth in disguise. And Uncle Garth gets the 10,000 gold coins. And he tasks, tosses Uncle Hub a sword. And Uncle Hub has one heck of a sword fight with this man. And he says, I am marrying Jasmine. And I'm going to let you live. But you know, if I let you live, you can never come after me again. You have to leave us alone. Well, he's got the woman of his dreams. He's got 10,000 gold pieces. He's got to have a wonderful life, hasn't he? He's going to let the sheep live. And that's as far as Uncle Garth is going to take the story. And Walter wants to know what happened to Jasmine. I can't tell you that. That's up to Uncle Hub. And Uncle Hub doesn't talk much. And right about this time, here comes another traveling salesman. And they've got the guns. And he says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know what you guys like to do. I've got the best thing possible for you. And he pulls out a machine that you use to shoot off clay pigeons to shoot at. And Walter says, why don't you spend some of your money? Why don't you have some fun? They've never thought about this before. Well, this kid wants to have some fun. Let's let him have some fun. And so you see him you know, selling off the clay pigeons and they're just having a final time. And once this fellow gets his toe through the door, somebody else comes and pretty soon they buy a boat and they're out in the water shooting the fish out there in the lake so that Walter can pull them up. Now we've got the little boy getting them to spend the money. They're having a little bit of fun with the little boy. Now Candlas takes us one step further. We're going to put in a garden. Hub says, a garden is an old person's activity. And of course, God says, we're old, aren't we? But there's a reason for this garden. And of course, at the time, we don't understand it. But you know what? Walter's never had a garden. Walter's never seen anything grow. And as this garden grows, something else grows too. Walter's going to get a letter from mother. Yes, I'm off at this school. I'm studying hard. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Well, that's a bunch of bull. I know you're nowhere. And he looks at the envelope and it's Las Vegas, Nevada. Mom's in Las Vegas. She's lied to me again. Well, he goes back to sit down and read his letter, knowing it's a lie. And here comes Uncle Garth with farmer's clothes. Hey, if we're going to farm, we're going to dress like farmers. And Hub doesn't think it's all that funny. And Uncle Walt turns to him and says, hey, we brought you some clothes too. For the first time, he feels like, hey, I'm, I'm one of the pair. I'm, I'm, I'm part of this. This is a family. I'm part of a real live family. And so they have a great time with this garden. I mean, when this garden starts to grow, the relationship grows. And that's what it's there for, to show how this wonderful thing is blossoming. But of course, Walter's not stupid. And he's looking at the rows of all of these different vegetables one day and says, well, aren't beets supposed to look different from beans? And aren't beans supposed to look different from corn? And they look at it and say, 
hey, we got snuggered. We got sold corn instead of all of these wonderful vegetables. But that's okay. They'll eat a lot of corn. They like it. It's fun. But what Walter knows now is he's a part of this. I can tell them when they've made a mistake. They don't get mad at me. It's wonderful. And he's out in the garden having a good day, time one day. And what do you know? A giraffe appears. It's on the back of a truck. A truck that moves service animals. What have they bought now? Mm -hmm. They have bought a lion. You see, Uncle Garth, when the war was over, became a man who took people on safaris in Africa. And he had to be social to deal with these people. And he became so famous, movie stars asked for him to guide them on a wild game hunt. He's the man who knows how to deal with people. Hub's the one who knows how to stay away from people and deal with problems. But now they've got something in this crate. And when it's unloaded, they tell Walter, stay away from it. It's a manhunter. Well, what's a manhunter? He wants to know, what have you got? They run into the house, of course, and change their clothes because, well, Garth's going to go hunting and he's got his safari clothes on. And, of course, Walter's look up and Garth's uh, hub has on a, a clean shirt and a hat, a cowboy hat. They're going to go hunting this thing. Well, what is this thing? open up the door and be very careful and he opens up the door and they peek in and this is a great shot because we see what the lion sees and of course that's these three peculiar people and there it is it's an old lioness we know it's actually a, a young cub and she's tired and when they say something about well when is she coming out she burps She's old, she's got indigestion, she's not gonna cause any trouble. And Walter doesn't think it's fair to go after this poor old lion, especially when this poor old lion belches. And he says, can I keep it? Sure, it's your pet, you have to take care of it. Well, he names it Jasmine. Hub wants to know how the devil he came up with that name. And of course, Garth plays them. He feeds her every day. He takes her water. You know, he loves this lion. He talks to this lion. He adores this lion. And we have this wonderful sequence where the uncles go to the local seed store and, and, and get Farina Lina Chow, 50 pound bags of it. And there's this beautiful cartoon about these two old men hugging them lugging this stuff around. But you know, Garth has to show he's a he-man and he's lifting these sacks all by himself. Walter has to help Garth. And of course, what happens to Uncle Hub? He passes out. He's old and he doesn't like to admit it. They put him in the hospital. He checks himself out. I'm not sick. I just passed out. Well, let's go have barbecue. But of course, the relatives who hear he's in the hospital come running with flowers. Oh, we're going to let him know we care about him. And the guys at the hospital say, he's gone. Oh, he's died. Yay. No, he just checked himself out. Oh. So they go back to the house and wait for him. Well, they're eating barbecue. And do you like this barbecue? Do you like this, Walter? And Walter belches. Yeah, he does. And then into this wonderful situation comes the local teenage hoods. And one of them's going to grab some of Hub's food. You don't do that. And Uncle Hub tells him, get lost, kid. And these teenagers start harassing. These teenagers start trying to cause trouble. And um, Walter's worried. Uncle Hub's going to get hurt. He's going to get hurt. And Uncle Garth says, uh, no, Uncle Garth's not going to get hurt. You just watch. But if it'll make you feel better, he goes out to the car and brings in one of the shotguns. But he's not going to need it. 
No, he's not going to need it at all. Because Uncle Garth grabs that teenager and he says, I'm not afraid of you, son. I've killed many men. I've loved one woman and you can't scare me. And he takes these kids on. And of course, he comes up the one who beats the living daylights out of him. Well, Walter thinks this is great. Uncle Hub's okay. Uncle Hub's all right. Yeah, Uncle Hub can take care of himself. You don't need to worry about him. But what we don't see is what goes on at the house while they're gone. Those nasty little boys had yanked off some of the, pla the uh, uh, planks from the cage. And yeah, Jasmine escapes. She gets away just a few minutes before Uncle Hub and Uncle Garth return. And when they learn that Jasmine has run off, they want to know where she's run to. And of course, this thing is not letting me move. Well, shook your darns, guys. Uh, we're trapped. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have to get rid of this, ask if Clifford Selby can get in, and I can't do it. So we're just stuck. Can we do it that way? It won't move. Let's go up there and see if you can touch that one. Okay, there, it moves. We're going to have to use the arrow if I can get yeah, it. To go. Okay, Jasmine has gone to the cornfield. That's where she belongs. Why? Why does Jasmine go to the cornfield? That's okay, we're all right. Hmm? She thinks it's her jungle? It's her jungle. It's the closest thing to a jungle. It's going to be her new home. Of course, everybody turns up. We're going to have to kill the, the uh, lion. And Walter says, no, no. He goes in and he's petting her and he's loving her. She's my pet. She won't hurt you. And so Jasmine stays in the cornfield <coughs> and the cousins, God bless you, the cousins leave because nobody died and they don't want him there. But before they leave, these teenagers, he's ridden home with the teenagers and he talks to them. You know, Walter says, what's he telling him? And he says, oh, he's giving the speech that he always gives to the young men in his army about being a man. Well, Walter is happy. Jasmine is safe. Those relatives are gone. Now he's got a question that has to be answered. And he waits until Uncle Garth goes down to have his nighttime fight. Now he's been told by Uncle Garth, don't wake him up. I tried to wake him up once and he just about tore my head off. Don't wake him up. But he wakes him up. And he's got a blanket that he's wrapped around it, but he's going to give that blanket to Uncle Hub. And he says, what happened to Jasmine? And Uncle Hub tells him, that's none of your business. Well, Walter wants to know. I don't want you to die anytime soon. I want you to stay healthy. I want to be with you. I want to be with you long enough that I can learn what you have to know to be a man. I want to hear that speech. And Hub is just stunned. And he tells Uncle Hub, I love you. What do you tell these people? Because I may not get to hear it. And he says, okay, look, the actual truth isn't always as important of your belief in ideals. That's what it is to be a man. And I'm like I am because Jasmine died giving birth to a little boy who died. That's why I'm like this. And of course, Walter gives him a hug and, oh, what do I do? Well, yeah, we get a connection now, an open connection between Hub 
and Walter, and there's already been a connection between Walter and Garth. But of course, Walter finds where the money is, and it's hidden in a barn, down in the floor, way down. He's been told, first of all, that they were gone for 40 years because they ran with Al Capone, and Al Capone's out to kill him, and that's why they came to Texas, because you can't find him there. Somebody else says, oh, they were bank robbers, really bad bank robbers. And the, the FBI has been looking for him all these years. Well, you know what? He doesn't care. He loves him. And then who turns up? In the middle of the night, it's mom with a guy named Stan, the latest boyfriend. Well, mom says, you know, we're, we're, we're going to take you with us now, and, and you need to tell us where that money is so we can take it with us. Walter's not going to tell her where that money is. That's not her money. That's his uncle's money. You can't have it. Well, Stan says, look, he has a badge. I'm with the FBI. And all I have to do is get all that money, and I can take it to the bank that they stole it from, and they'll be okay. <laughs> Walter doesn't buy it. And Stan hits him. And Stan knocks him down while Walter's trying to run away. And Stan would hit him again, except here comes Jasmine. And Jasmine jumps on top of Stan, and there's a momentary growl. And of course, the brothers come out. And Jasmine has died protecting her cub. She's kind of made a mess out of Stan. Stan's going to have to go to the hospital. He's not dead, but she mauled him up pretty good, taking care of this cub of hers. Well, mom's back. They bury Jasmine in the cornfield. And you notice he's sitting out there on the porch. We saw him at the beginning. He doesn't look like that little boy anymore, and he's unhappy because he's going to be leaving with mother. They buried Jasmine in the cornfield, and the uncle's really dressed up for this, for this funeral. And as May drives off with Walter and Stan in the back seat all bandaged up, they admit there isn't any way we can keep him. We're too old. We're too distant in relationship. We need this kid, but we can't get it. We've lost him. But here comes a bridge. Why do we have a bridge? When you cross a bridge, you go from one place to another. And as a general rule, when you cross that bridge, you're not going to come back over it again. Well, he doesn't want to cross that bridge. And he jumps out of the car. And of course, May stops the car and says, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm taking you to Las Vegas and you're going to live with Stan. And he says, yeah. Has he hit you yet? He knows. He knows the kind of guys mom has picked up with. And he says, mom, I don't want that life. I want you to think about somebody other than yourself once in your life. And you know what I want and what I need, and where I need to be. Well, the uncles are sitting on the front porch. He's talked to mom. All they know is he's gone now. They're on the front porch and the dogs go nuts. And they run down to the road and here he comes. You know, he ran off down that road once, intending never to come back. And he could have gone away and not come back. But he's back, and the dogs are happy to see him, and his uncles are happy to see him, and he says, now look, there's rules here. From now on, you don't eat as much meat, and you eat a lot of vegetables. And you're going to have to learn about the Boy Scouts and parent-teachers meetings and all of the stuff that goes with having a kid, and you have to live and tell it, I at least graduate from high school and hopefully college. That's the only way I'm going to stay. <laughs> well, 
Well, that's where the flashback ends. And now we're back in Walter's real world. When the movie opened, you saw these two old men in a biplane, didn't you? And they flew underneath an, an uh, overpass. And now, well, you know what the old guys were doing. They were trying to fly upside down through the barn. <laughs> Didn't quite make it. But as he says, they were happy. They were doing things they wanted to do. They just weren't sitting on the porch. They were out doing things. They were doing things I told them they weren't supposed to do dangerous stuff anymore, but you know them. They were having fun. And the sheriff says, hey, CNN actually came out. Uh, two 90-year-old men trying to fly upside down through a barn. They wanted to put this on television. And somebody else had seen that. And this helicopter lands. And one of the brothers had said they figured the reason the sheep never came after Hub was because he struck oil and got rich. And this helicopter is owned by an oil company. And out comes this very definite rich Arabian man with a little boy. And he said, I, I recognize the names. Your great uncles could have been my great grandfathers if my father had married Jasmine. But I want you, my son, to meet you because you're part of that story. And Walter suddenly realizes this all happened. This was real. It's a great, great way to end their lives. And of course, <laughs> there's the last thing they bought, a yacht. It's out on, hey, they don't shoot fish anymore. They go out on the yacht that goes nowhere. But we know this movie was popular because Somebody made a musical of it, oh. and it was shown up in uh, the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle, Washington, and it ran for a year. <laughs> Very popular. So now, you know why I picked this movie, and you know what it means to be loved and cared for in a way similar to the way Woody was loved and cared for. But next week, Linda Rutledge will be with us on Zoom. And you can see here the actual truck that they used to take those giraffes across the country. So now we've seen a different take on a coming of age story. And next week we'll get to hear why she decided to write this book. And I thank you for being so patient with our problems. And have a good evening. Thank you all for being so patient. That was, um, as you know, not typical of us or of the Aiton's excellent teaching presentation skills. So every now and then we just have a little mess up. <laughs> it was worth it. Good, good. I'm glad to hear you think so. We'll have a safe trip. We enjoyed it very much. Is it that's technical?